So yeah, so my talk is about um, students creating and project managing uh, open educational resources. Um, so it's a bit of a weird one for me um, because like I'm normally a teacher researcher specializing in uh, listening um, and phonology really. Um, I also do a bit about straightforward methods for classroom research. I'm a bit experimental in my uh, use of qualitative research as well. Um, and I like writing about classroom practices too. So um, basically the overview of the talk is a why, a how and a what. So, um, so why I decided to do this. Uh, how it went ahead and then what transpired basically so uh, kicking off with the why well we have to do something um, and there needs to be some kind of uh, topic to f facilitate academic uh, listening and uh, reading and uh, writing and speaking activities and um, this course was um, sort of academic English listening course per se um, and uh, what happened there um, was um, that um, basically um, I, I needed some kind of carrier topic for a lecture course and I thought we'll do the productivity literature oh by the way Tobias um, Chuck Pearson just appeared on yeah I saw uh, it already yeah. cool thanks so much um, so, yeah, um, so I decided to do the productivity uh, literature um, as a, a topic and then we needed something to produce um, to check learning. So um, I thought um, using the sustainable development goals as a topic for um, uh, teaching uh, materials would be really useful. Um, I mean, the, sustain the sustainable development goals are not perfect by any means. Um, so um, they have um, been thought of as kind of neoliberal lip service to serious issues um, and not really getting through to any kind of solution. Um, also, arguments do frequently rage about the United Nations relevance in the 21st century. That being said, I do think that uh, the SDGs are definitely better than nothing. And uh, so far, um, they are um, kind of improving um, on kind of what some grassroots movements uh, have achieved. So it's kind of frustrating to see like people with uh, the best intentions um, trying to get through um, and solve a problem, but um, kind of without this being joined up, it does sort of end up being quite frustrating so i think you know for all that they don't go far enough you know at, at least there are some kind of goals there um why open educational resources well i think you know if we can get meaningful output it's great and sort of this helps to um, set it up as uh, kind of beyond japan which is big problem sometimes for um teaching languages in Japan because the Japanese government um, frequently says it wants to use English as a vehicle for uh, transmitting Japanese culture around the world. Um, however, I'd like students to kind of think a little bit beyond their own doorstep and how Japan uh, interacts with the world. Um, students can also learn a lot from thinking about teaching, like what is actually um, key to understanding uh, concepts of sustainable development goals and so on um, and basically what's signal what's noise um, and then uh, this enables them to move beyond superficial search results um, you know if i don't want them to give me information that comes from the top page of google clearly and so also because i'm a big proponent of task-based language teaching um, I would like students to kind of have a realistic and meaningful task um, in front of them where they can interact together, um, use the language, run into difficulties with the language so that causes them uh, to 
require improvement um, in how they communicate and then they can notice um, what they don't know and what they need to do um, to communicate more clearly in their second or foreign language. So how I did this, um, as I said, um, looked at the productivity literature. Um, and yeah, so these are some of the books that I looked at um, during the lectures. So um, Grit and Mindset, which are books that I don't really love at all. Um, but they have some good points in there, but some very troubling points in there. I'm quite critical of positive psychology as a whole. Um, there's also the general business like neoliberalism in the productivity um, kind of literature um, and kind of seven habits of highly effective people is quite an odd book in many ways. Um, but there are ways that there are things that students can certainly take from uh, these books to apply um, to the culture of learning and how to manage time better and how to just get through um, projects with very few humps. Um, but I'm quite aware that a lot of the things in here are a bit kind of managerial bro. Um, and, you know, women are quite frequently invisible in the productivity literature, unless we're going into like kind of the psychology side of things. So um, students, um, oh, sorry, um, students um, self-selected themselves um, into groups according to um, sustainable development goal interests. So one group decided to tackle an SDG overview, and then we had uh, groups presenting on uh, gender, equi gender equality, um, reduced inequalities, in particular um, uh, racism, um, then another group producing materials on um, responsible uh, consumption and production. Another uh, still on climate action, which is a big thing uh, uh, in my department, we actually have a climate action committee. And then surprisingly, um, partnerships for the goals uh, was chosen by one group, which I don't know, it just seems one of the least sexy SDGs in many ways, but uh, or certainly it's one of the ones that troubles me um, because it kind of seems like it could quite easily be heavily bound to business. Um, uh, yeah. So anyway, um, they um, took part in uh, scrum meetings, um, at least one per lesson. Um, and this is to encourage uh, peer accountability for getting work done. Um, one of the problems with group work at university, as uh, probably all of you know, is that, well, there's often somebody trying to get a free ride uh, on every assignment. Uh, so um, this means that everybody knows who has to do what, who is doing it, and whether it's being done, how far it's getting done, um, and so, as I say, that's usually uh, in each uh, lesson session, um, given over about 10 to 15 minutes of scrum time, um, and students were encouraged to have uh, scrum uh, meetings uh, outside of the classroom as well. Um, so the course ran over 15 sessions within a quarter, so this is about over eight weeks. Um, and uh, run as follows. So we had an orientation generally to the psychology of productivity. And I looked um, at uh, grit and mindset uh, there, and then the origins of productivity as a discipline. So like um, Taylorism, Fordism. Um, we then looked at uh, Eisenhower matrices and urgency and kind of time sensitivity and then uh, smart goals, and then there was a quiz to check um, learning of the productivity uh, literature. Um, then we looked at uh, plan, do, check, act, and uh, then uh, Gantt charts and time blocking um, for kind of visual kind of productivity planning and uh, Pomodoros. Um, then uh, we looked at the seven habits in week seven because I can't resist doing something like that. Um, then um, we moved on to David Allen's Getting Things Done system, then on to Agile, um, 
kind of development and uh, Kanban uh, system of kind of tracking uh, work being done. Um, that works quite well with the Scrum mains. I think in hindsight that could have been uh, brought a little bit earlier into um, the syllabus, but um, I think because it kind of got addressed um, through the back door, through the Scrum meetings, it wasn't such a huge issue. Um, we also looked at deep work um, and the heaven of the quiz, then uh, deliberate practice, and uh, then uh, Mihai Chikson, Mihai's flow uh, theory, um, which a lot of students uh, had really loved. I mentioned them earlier on in the course when we looked at growth mindset and grit, because Duckwiss uh, looks at uh, both uh, Ericsson and Chikson Mihai in her grit book. And we looked at bullet journal journaling as well. Um, I'd mentioned it a little bit earlier in the course in passing and showed mine, but I actually went into it as a system uh, in the final uh, phase of the course. Then looked at criticisms of productivity systems and kind of, well, basically the general bro-ishness of it. And um, also that it seems to be geared towards making other people money rather than making yourself happy quite a lot of the time. But there are exceptions there, um, strangely with uh, Covey especially, he's kind of thinking of this as a way for general happiness rather than just kind of late stage capitalism, but to an extent, I'd say. And then there was a reflection exercise on what they'd learned and what they could take forward. And there was a test. So next is what transpired. Um, so basically what happened is that the students actually were really enthused about this. I mean, the SDGs, are kind of one of the reasons that many of them chose that the course chose the course that they're on. Um, so it was um, quite interesting. I, I was expecting them to like it, but some of them actually really loved it. Um, so yeah, yay me, but I mean, it's, it's good. Um, some clear leaders emerged within those projects. Um, so it was quite nice to see that some students were like kind of I feel really invested in this project. So I'd like to take more of a leading role in the scrum meetings and that's totally fine, but I did want at least every student to have a chance to lead a scrum. Um, but just because you're leading a scrum doesn't necessarily mean that you're leading the entire project. Um, there was some stress involved because we had such a tight turnaround time. Um, I wanted it finished within the 15 sessions, um, which should be enough really. Um, but some students kind of are perfectionists and they felt a bit stressed out and it's like, well, you know, it doesn't need to be perfect. It just needs to be finished. You know, um, there's no such thing as perfect, but this is something I possibly want to deal with a bit more in, uh, in future iterations of this course. Um, so what actually got produced is available on one of my websites. Um, and so, yeah, these are available for people to download. They're available in either Word or PowerPoint and PDF. I know some people like PDFs, um, but you can't really edit them very well. Um, so, yeah, um, all of those groups put up their work. Uh, well, they, the, the work was done in Google Docs, but our um, institutional uh, Google accounts are locked down. You can't share them with the outside world, which is kind of good and bad in, in some ways. So um, the group dealing with SDGs overviews, um, they had a really nice schema activation activity within uh, their uh, materials, just asking people what SDGs do you know and can you guess them? Can you fit them uh, to the little icon and stuff? Um, and you know, um, that's very manipulable by teachers. You know, they could actually download this and uh, take out some of those words and so on. Um, there's also a really nice call for action based on ideas discussed in peer groups. This could possibly result in, you know, more action um, on the part of students because it's things that they want to do. Um, but, you know, it's something that it's going to be highly individual, I guess. Um, then gender inequality. Um, this was a look from a Japanese perspective. Um, 
I did ideally want students to look a bit outside of Japan, um, but they did do that as well. Um, but um, kind of Japan has a kind of very much a patriarchal kind of image, um, kind of the salary man and the office worker and, you know, all of the high achieving business people in Japan are male and it is very much a business hero kind of culture in many ways. Um, but there are some very, very notable women in Japanese history and some quite radical women um, in many ways. And so the students uh, felt very strongly that this should be visible um, and not only uh, female students pushing this, but actually um, some of uh, the, the male students in the class too. Um, of course, when this was taught, it was uh, last summer, autumn, um, so kind of fresh up to George Floyd um, kind of fallout and um, the shootings of Asians uh, in uh, the US and this unnerved quite a few students. So um, they did want to point this out, but they felt that going on a diatribe never really is so productive from their point of view. Um, I kind of disagree, <laughs> um, but it's I wanted them to have ownership of the project. So it's uh, it's kind of good that way. So um, students felt that exposing racism as untenable or stupid was more likely to have people kind of really engage with the topic. And, you know, um, there's quite a few unnerving facts in there about just how prevalent racism is, especially extremely quite violent um, racism. Um, we looked at fast fashion, um, particular global chains and landfill problems. There's some really engaging video listening there um, for uh, learners to take part in. Um, the climate change uh, unit has uh, got some wonderful, very short writing. Um, the whole point of the short writing is that students then don't feel too tired uh, from spending their time writing and kind of you know, that mental exhaustion uh, that results uh, from uh, language learners doing things like that. And then uh, the final unit you know, was design thinking, which I thought was a very interesting, innovative way to consider uh, the collaboration SDG. Um, and that was based around two listings and readings. Um, there were no original texts constructed as all authentic materials. Um, anything that was copied and pasted into Word documents um, was copied from kind of open uh, sources like Wikipedia. Um, and things were scaffolded for language learning. Um, so that things that my students thought were interesting and exciting, they could be provided in an authentic way for learners in other classrooms. So what's coming next? Well, hopefully students will uh, use these like real students, not just my students, but um, uh, other people around the world. And hopefully um, there'll be more materials uh, made by my current cohort who I've actually got a bigger cohort this year, so we can maybe put a bigger dent in that uh, bunch of SDGs that have still no materials with them. Um, I might use document templates this year so they look a bit more uniform. I'm not totally decided on this because there are pros and cons. And because we've got larger um, numbers of students in the class, then that might mean that some students could go out and try to get interviews with people outside of the classroom or um, we could produce more written text and have like people dedicate time to that. but. We'll see. Um, it's just something to think about for the moment. Um, but yeah, so if you want to get in touch with me about this, then uh, these are the ways to get in contact with me. Um, so yeah, I did previously have a Twitter handle on here, but I just deleted my Twitter. So uh, yeah, and so hit me up on my websites and stuff. And if you have any questions, I am very happy to hear them. Or also actually criticisms as well. And I see Klaus has his hand raised already. 
I'd go ahead, Klaus. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Mark. Very, very, very nice talk. I'm, I'm super, super interested, like in teaching in Japan as, as I also teach here. So I'm super curious about how the people do it, even if we do like different stuff. Um, I have lots of questions, but I just want a uh, first one to be a little bit more like get into a little bit more detail about your class. You mentioned like uh, how many students were you teaching this time? Uh, what was the academic background? What was their English level? And if this is the first time you're teaching this course, so if you could give some more background, yeah. that would be great. It's, it's the very first time I taught the course. It was my first year in that department. Um, the students coming in, they are bound. That's quite a wide gap. So, but those students, it was 23 students in the class. Um, they're around B1 level of English, but some had lived overseas and so they're quite fluent, but their academic literacies are um, not, or were not so high. Um, so, yeah. It just to, just to complete the background, like are all these students from the same department or do they have different academic yeah. backgrounds? Yeah, they're all in the same department, but it is an interdisciplinary department where the Department of Global Innovation Studies. So um, we our professors are in marketing, finance, um, accounting, um, uh, innovation. So there's an economist teaching innovation and kind of like startup kind of uh, things, um, it's his kind of specialism. Another professor um, who deals with innovation and entrepreneurship um, looks at things like cooperatives and so on, um, takes students away to um, the Basque region and uh, looks at Mondragon with uh, field work with our undergrads and stuff. So it's, it's quite broad church. Um, so and we're English medium instruction. So students know that they're gonna come in and they're gonna do uh, the lion's share of their learning in English. They can take courses outside of the department in Japanese, um, but there's a limited amount of that available to them. Yeah. Fantastic, thank you. I didn't see whose hands went up first, so Tobias, I don't know if you did. <laughs> uh, I think Chuck was first. Okay. Um, thanks for the talk, Mark. Really interesting stuff. Um, one thing, I got in late and I just came in at the point where you were talking about um, the Japanese government um, having an interest in culture being um, communicated in English for broader purpose. Uh, could you expand on that a little bit and um, try to give a perspective of what what type of environment from that political perspective? Or yeah, I think it's the, the Japanese government sees um, sort of, well, I'll, I'll make no bones about it, you know, the, um, the governments of Britain and uh, the US are very, very culturally imperialist in many ways and so they use kind of language teaching as soft power um, and that transmits a lot of kind of ideas about what English speaking countries are and what they represent and things and the Japanese government knows that well people are interested in learning Japanese but that's a very very small number but they can have a bigger impact and use soft power from uh, having especially college students going around the world and kind of discussing what um, Japanese culture is, you know, how it's not necessarily just anime and it's not just kind of, you know, cars and like household electrical goods and things like that. So, you know, it's, things are either ninjas or manga um but yeah. actually the government wants a kind of finer point on that but essentially it is really just to kind of get people to buy more japanese stuff i guess <laughs> thanks man yeah and tamara um yeah thank you really for that interesting talk um it was it was very interesting um to hear 
about about your project. Um, I was wondering. I think there's um, several like MOOCs online now that were produced by students, um, and I've always wondered how much work is it for the teacher to um, post process <laughs> in a way the materials that students uh, create there. So how how was that process? How much work was it for you and how much work was it for the students and do your students consider it a success so do they um yeah what's, yeah what's your they take? did um they did find it um a success yeah it was um to be honest they were like kind of a bit tired at the end of the course but um i was kind of uh, acting as basically a sort of editor in chief. And I said, like, you get things done, I'll take a look at it, I'll proofread it. Um, Cause like, you know, if I put my name to it, I want it to be something that I'm proud of too. But said so I also gave them the choice of this being anonymous or you could put your name to your work. And all of them said, yeah, I'd like to put my name to my work. Um, so that was great because, um, often um, Japanese students don't want to stand out in this way um, and a lot of kind of people like well I don't mind doing work but I don't want my name on it because what if people judge me but they were happy to be judged because they knew that it was high quality and I think possibly it was just because it had the, the validation that I'm the teacher and I'm looking at it and saying yeah this is actually good enough to go out into the world um, and they looked at kind of, I talked in other courses about the notion of peer review, so like journal articles and that, well, actually, this should be able to be trusted because it's been checked by at least two kind of qualified people. Um, so this is what I want you to do with your work too. So you're maybe experts in training. So proofread each other's work and then it comes to me. So I went through the notion of dog fooding uh, which is something that um, software engineers do where they use their own software and see how it kind of works or doesn't work um, frequently. Um, so yeah, um, and they like the idea of like, kind of, yeah, you have to eat the dog food to know whether it's really tasty and it's like, yeah. And so they were like, hmm, I want to taste other people's dog food too. It's like, oh, this is what I want you to do. Yeah. So um, that was good. Um, and so there, there was one of the things that my, uh, I came into the department as one as the previous long term department chair was going on sabbatical and he said, basically, we want our students to be proactive. And I was like, well, yay, great. This gives me the perfect vehicle to have the students be proactive. I like students to be proactive too, because that means that I don't have to micromanage them and kind of get stressed about absolutely everything. So um, I get, I got stressed about some stuff like kind of, you know, oh my God, are they really, really uh, taking on board things uh, or are they doing stuff in the class or are they actually doing out of work class, uh, out of work, out of class work. Um, and, but yeah, that was, it was not a problem for this course that I was teaching. I did teach other courses at the same time to the same group of students. And some of that work was kind of put on the back burner um, because this was quite uh, a lot more engaging. And I was like, hmm, I don't really want to make a less engaging course, but <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a weird one, yeah. Anyway, that, I just realized my answer was about nine years long, so apologies. <laughs> so, yeah, and I guess Tobias, you had your hand up just before Klaus did this time, so we'll go on a nice little circle and stuff. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering um, about the methods um, the students used in their material. Did you provide them with methods or the set of methods they could use, or did they take them from their own language learning experience, probably having filled out tons of these like worksheets before? Yeah, that's what I um, told them. I said, um, you've had access to language learning materials before, and um, you've got textbooks. I, because I'm new to the department, I couldn't make all of the materials for every course that I teach. 
um, but I try to not use textbooks because I find most of them very unengaging. But I said, like, I've got some good textbooks. So which parts do you like? Which parts do you think have major weaknesses? So have a look at the things that you as a learner kind of like from your own uh, textbooks and stuff. And what, what do you want to do? What would you have wanted to do um, when you were like in your final year or your second year of high school? Um, I said, kind of pitch your um, materials just a little bit lower um, than you are yourselves. Because, you know, if they're pitching it at the same level, um, probably they get over ambitious and kind of overstretch themselves and then end up with stress headaches every week. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they did well with actually pitching at an appropriate level, I thought. Um, that was something I kind of had misgivings about. I didn't really have to step in and say, this is not appropriate. Yeah. So interesting. surprising, I'll be honest. Yeah. So, yeah, they, they were quite good at regulating themselves. So, and just taking a look at things like critically. Um, so, you know, like, yeah, TED Talks are good, but you don't want to use TED Talk for everything. And I was like, yeah, because, you know, it's, it gets, you know, so imagine a world if, but I was like, mm -hmm. so the, that's one of the things that I really liked about the, the fast fashion group is that they picked a, a, one of their listings is absolutely fantastic. It's not a TED talk, but it's, it's a similar kind of vibe, uh, let's say, but um, it's kind of going on about the, the evils of kind of how we just buy stuff, get sick of it. And then even when we think we're recycling clothes, they don't really get recycled. They just end up in landfill or they get exported to Africa to be, yeah basically avoiding landfill in our own countries and stuff so, but, and they were like yeah we also consume fast fashion we're college students you know we're not we're, we're not made of money um so they put a note at the end of their materials like saying we'd like people to cherish their clothes for as long as they're you know able to wear them and it was, yeah exactly it was very much uniqlo uh being targeted there uniqlo zara and i think bershka were um the three example brands that students used. So, yeah, yeah. And Klaus, you've been waiting so patiently. I know I have a tendency to ramble. Oh no, I, I love your humble, ramble, ramble on. But uh, actually I was kind of thinking when you were talking about, because you started talking about how you, you discussed with the students, like all the self-help books and you went over for them and you criticized them. And then you talked about the, SDGs and creating the, the 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 teaching materials from the SDGs, and it was really not clear to me. Like in your lecture plan, how these two things connected? Are they done in parallel? Do you do first one and then the other? So maybe I missed something during the oh, yeah. talk. But could you talk a little bit more about yeah. that? Like, so it was basically a lecture series about the productivity literature. But I said, mm -hmm. well to basically be able to assess how much you understand about the productivity literature, I need you to produce something. Um, so, so if you produce open education resources, the, where we can put something good out into the world. It could make a difference. You know, there's not really a lot about SDGs, um, language learning uh, material wise, apart from there's like a textbook, but it's very wishy-washy. So the idea is like they use the ideas they saw related to the productivity literature yeah. on the SDG, to on the on the let's produce uh, yeah. material teaching materials, and the theme of the teaching materials is the SDG. Exactly. Yeah. So there got it. Um, there got were it. like um, five five groups. Um, I think it was, um, and so that was basically to organize those groups. I said choose. SDGs that you're interested in, uh, we probably should have an introduction group. Um, so if you're interested in the introduction group, like put your name on the board, um, but like rank yourself, like kind of which SDG are you interested in, pick your top three, um, or whether you're interested in the overview as well. And there didn't have to be, there wasn't so much negotiation between um, 
who could be in which group. Um, we got roughly equal numbers and some people were like, well, I see that that group doesn't have so many people there. And well, one of my friends is in that group, so I'll just change from this one, which is my first choice to the second choice and things like that. So that was actually really nice. I am expecting chaos um, in the upcoming semester because of 32 students. Maybe all of the sexy STGs have already been taken now. So, yeah, like, who's going to want to do peace and justice, man? Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was, yeah, thanks. Um, it was, I was quite aware that it did seem like a two half course. My syllabus only really indicated that there were themes on there. Um, on the self-help and productivity literature um, because I wasn't 100% sure whether I'd go ahead with SDGs or whether um, there might be other kind of activist sort of work led by one of the other professors in the department um, that students might then want to uh, take on and use the same kind of uh, productivity, productivity methods um, to apply to those projects. Um, I was talked into trying to do stuff for our model United Nations, um, producing information packets for that, but the schedules just don't match. So um, I'm going to stick with this uh, kind of project and uh, hopefully students will remain enthused. And if not, well, we can always pivot. <laughs> so, yeah. Excuse the noise, my son's in the shower and doing weird stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Did, you, did you get anything like surprising from the, the, the stuff that the students produce? Anything like out of, that really made you a well, what? Yeah, um, I was really, really surprised. Uh, um, the students went into kind of quite detail about um, Pacific Islander um, racism. Um, in, when they're tackling racism. I was expecting that they'd go with the easy option of Black Lives Matters uh, because it's just so in the news, um, but they kind of avoided it um, deliberately. Um, one of the things that uh, they said to me was, well, if we create um, language learning materials about Black Lives Matters, well, a lot of students will know about this anyway and it won't encourage them to think about something they don't know so much about um, that's pretty cool yeah so I was, I was like that's really great logic actually um because you know a lot of textbook producers kind of stick with very easy actually quite facile topics and it's it's kind of irritating as a teacher to sort of actually have students saying like yeah this is possibly too easy we can still make other stuff easy to deal with and that was really great um and yeah the, the amount of pacific islanders um like uh, experiencing uh quite hideous and violent racism is uh fairly disturbing um and student but students didn't kind of diatribe it they were very sensitive with the topic and that they make a persuasive argument over the course of the materials so i was, I was really happy with that I was also incredibly um, happy with the students that decided to look at design thinking for the collaboration um, unit. And theirs is a simple word document. It's a lesson plan to be teacher led, but um, and like sections of that plan to be printed off as worksheets or cut and pasted into additional word documents. Um, and that that was incredible because they made it interesting them they made it their own really um and it was a it was a group that were quite able but also a group that oh that it's weird they're so able but so um lacking confidence um sometimes and there was a lot of uh hand holding in the early stages like no this actually is quite a good idea um you, it's very very uh early days moment but if you plan it carefully you can definitely make something good of this and they were really happy with their output so i was a proud teacher i like, feel, feel like a parent at home and a parent at work uh, so 
Yeah. Uh, are they students first year students? Last yes, year they are. Students? They're, they're first year students. Really? Um, first year students? Wow. First year students. Yeah, I, I work them to the bone. <laughs> um, so I do teach um, a limited number of uh, kind of uh, fourth and third and second year students. But um, basically, I teach uh, one group of 23 first year students for almost all of their um, in, well, yeah, the vast majority of their language courses. I think they have a leadership um, like kind of workshop with another um, uh, teacher that kind of goes into language teaching a little. Um, but um, mostly I'm their only language, their only language oh, yeah, lessons in English. They uh, are obliged to learn a second foreign language um, as part of their course. And so they're basically an even split between French and Spanish with a small number uh, taking German classes and a small number taking Chinese classes and Korean classes. Although Korean seems to be um, getting more and more popular this year. So, yeah, I don't know, maybe Blackpink. Yeah. So, yeah. But it was, it's, really, it's good because I can develop that relationship in the first semester with them and they can then trust me. So when I can in, when I introduce crazy course in second semester, that's going to involve a lot of work. They can buy into it. But I think if I'd introduced it in the first semester, I'd possibly not be alive by the second. <laughs> so then if there are no further questions, are there? No. Mm -hmm. 